around some of the ideas I introduced in the first lecture, ground them in a discussion about water and uh, in California, in the, in the American West. So some of you might have heard uh, from the news. California is uh, in its fourth year of drought, and its uh, snowpack is at an all-time uh, low. And uh, there are sensational images circulating, like there is a series of them in the New York Times, but they're in the New York Times, but they're quite fun to see. That they are depicting a state, a state at the verge of uh, drying. So, you know, there is this spatial thing which is uh, depicting the limits to growth, the end of growth of California. You know, it's the desert, and then the, the state has reached as far as it could, making everything green, but this thing seems to be coming to an end. Uh, from film noirs, <clears throat> like Chinatown, a fantastic movie if you haven't watched it, to environmental classics, like uh, Cadillac Desert, fantastic book if you haven't read it, a California's epic battles for water, animate imagination, an end <coughs> to California's dream, the land of celluloid dreams, acts as a reminder often of the fragility of Western civilization. So I want to be a little bit uh, opportunistic and use this powerful image and imagination of uh, the end of growth in California, water bringing the end of growth in California, uh, as an entry point to revisit and rethink the relationship between resources, power, and by power I don't mean hydropower, someone thought I was favorable of dams and sent me some tweets saying you should talk against dams in your presentation. No, by power I mean political power and growth, economic growth. So in the first part of my lecture, uh, I want to talk, it will be more about the ecological economics of uh, water. And here I want to visit two perennial questions. First, whether resources, in our case today water, determine in some way or limit growth. So the standard discussion, are the limits to growth because of resources? Are resources important for growth or are they just a secondary factor? And in relation whether economic growth necessarily brings an increase in the use of resources. I will explain why this is a blind spot for macroeconomists, and I will refute, as those of you who know my work on the growth expect, I will refute the hypothesis of dematerialization. That is the hypothesis that as economies grow, they tend to use less and less materials, in that case water. In the second part of my lecture, and I apologize in advance that the two parts of my lecture might seem a little bit, uh, as I say, we're in two parts, so they're quite different. So in the second part of my lecture, I'm going to talk about the political ecology of water. And there I will review the literature on California's water wars to examine how political power shapes water. The question in this part is not whether water limits in some aggregate way economic growth. It is rather who and how can enroll water in the production of one kind of future while foreclosing other possible futures. Rather than thinking about power over water, I will argue, we should see water as power, control of water as an exercise in power, and the materialization of power. So I'll try to honor today a little bit the, label, the title of the lecture with the risk of becoming too pedantic. I think it fits more like a lecture to a class today rather than a presenting a paper or a cohesive argument. So this is not going to be the type of lecture where I present the thesis and defend it with some data, etc. But more an over sweeping review of some literature that I happen to like a lot. And I think there is something that connects it. So in the first part of the lecture, it will be a lot about the question of growth and ecological economics, and in the second part about the political ecology of water. But why do I do that? For me, it was a challenge to present here in the Water and Development Center, because for years, I mean, I started my PhD, I was always working with water resource issues. Uh, water, my wife called me a water nerd at some point. It wasn't very kind of her. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I decided to abandon water. <laughs> no, that was not the reason. The reason was that I, I also got uh, interested in many other issues. So at some point, through ecological economics, I passed into the questions of growth and the environment and limits to growth. And this is what I talked in the first lecture. But today, I took the opportunity to try and see if I can link the two parts. Because I say, okay, I am one person. I went from one to the other. So there must be obviously some link. And of course, there is. So about my degrowth 
Uh, my finger of work I, I will not be talking today, but let me say a few words about uh, what has been my research on water so that you can see a trajectory of where these ideas I'm presenting here are coming from. So from my PhD, I studied the... Uh, my PhD was on the history of water in Athens, Greece. And I started as a naive environmental scientist and I was asking why did the city keep building new dams when reducing the demand for water was cheaper and better for the environment? And there were studies that more or less were shown in this. With a historical institutional approach, I showed how the spectacular growth of the city of Athens uh, from a few thousand people before the first war, so most of you do not know this, but Athens until, almost until the beginning of uh, the 20th century was revealed that it was in the city. Uh, it reached the city of 4 million by the 1990s. So I showed how this spectacular growth uh, of Athens was part and parcel of its capacity to grab water from the countryside. And the picture here is uh, the main dam from the main dam, dam that supplies the city of Athens with water, 300 kilometers away. The whole town there was sunk and the people removed in order to get water for Athens. I deconstructed in my PhD technical discourses, models and calculations that frame water demand as something exogenous driven by population and income, and I showed instead how new dams fueled their own demand by facilitating the growth of the city. For my postdoc at Berkeley, and here comes the relative knowledge of what is happening in California, I studied CalFed, and CalFed is a California's unique in scale and resources, some 10 billion, I think, were reported to this program, 10 billion dollars, water governance process. Uh, when I was studying this, and I'm not going to say what I studied here, but the similarity, what struck me the most were the similarities with Greece. There were a lot of nice words about water conservation, participation, governance, integrated management of water, but behind them, what my interlocutors, my, the people I interviewed, called the elephant in the room of the negotiations. And by this, it took me some time as a foreigner to understand what was this elephant in the room. I was looking for it, but I couldn't see it. <laughs> but apparently it meant economic growth and plans for a humongous $25 billion worth water transfer to the farmers of the Central Valley in the cities of the South. This is a project called the Peripheral Canal, uh, that no one was talking about the negotiations, but was always in the background. All, everyone knew that the negotiations were at the end about that. And this is a very emblematic project that in the 1982, uh, the environmentalists in California managed to defeat it in the ballot. And it was just one of the most emblematic victories of the environmental movement that they managed to stop a huge water project in California. But developers ever since have tried to bring it back with different reasons this time. Now, now the main reason is like water scarcity and also the risk of the water supply system to be destroyed by an earthquake. When I arrived in Barcelona in 2008, so you learn a little bit about my life now, uh, there was a terrible drought. And people were telling me, you are lucky, you know, like the things you are studying, you are here at the right moment, at the right place. So the new newspapers then in Barcelona were talking about a water war uh, happening in Barcelona, and they meant a war over the polemical proposals to transfer water either from River Ebro in the south of Barcelona, or more ambitiously, and this was a proposal of Catalan nationalists, from River Rhone in the south of France. So they didn't want water from Spain, they wanted water from, from France. With my colleague Iago Otero, uh, we decided instead to study history, not what was happening at that time, but history, and the real water war. So we analyzed the municipal archive uh, of his own town, Mata de Pera, which is a small dormitory town uh, for Barcelona's rich today. It's a, a elite suburb, a few kilometers outside of our university. Something like, we called it, to sensationalize a little bit our article, we called it the Beverly Hills of Catalonia. <laughs> so, well, I think it captures a little bit the, the feeling of the place. In our analysis, which was historical, we drew parallels between the water battles of environmentalists versus developers in Barcelona today, that day, with that of peasants against landlords during the civil war. So we studied the water war, a uh, real war over water and land during the civil war of Catalonia. And we argued that control of water, enforced often with violence, was vital in erasing a possible future of small-scale peasant agriculture in Catalonia and instead of producing one of tourism and suburban villas. So what we did was to unearth the conflicts and the battles through which control of water produces one future, villas, what you see there, 
rather than something different, which was there in the air and it was a peasant agriculture, decentralized agriculture. My water work made me see growth as a resource fueled and power ridden process that produces surpluses for the powerful in some places while shifting costs to the powerless in the environment in others. Hence, I think I came to the idea of the growth, the hypothesis of an alternative egalitarian mode of downscale production and consumption. So I will close my presentation with some reflections on what I will talk there about uh, the growth. So let me start with ecological economic question because I think I'm going to slow. So can water bring an end to growth? And this begs the question, does water contribute in some way to growth? Because if water is irrelevant for growth, of course, lack of water cannot bring an end to growth. One finds few views to this question in macroeconomics. I studied it recently, macroeconomics. But I said, okay, let's do a job here. So I searched for the water in Gregory Mankiw's textbook on macroeconomics, the one that most people learn macroeconomics from. So what did I find? Find the bathtub which is a metaphor for stocks and flows or capital and income. That's the only time the word water appears in the 600 pages of Gregory Markov's book. Darwin and Semoglu, in his advanced textbook on economic growth, is a little bit more careful than say the Markov. He accepts that natural endowments, what economists call geography, which is not the geography that geographers understand that geography, but for them everything like this is a geography, that this may affect productivity, he says, sure. But then he goes on to say the statistics show that it doesn't. Geography doesn't matter really for economic growth. And he makes some clever examples. He says, okay, after all, if geography was what is driving growth, then why South and North Korea would be that different? You capture a little bit uh, the point. Of course, he does much more complicated econometrics to show that geography doesn't matter, but that's the thrust of the argument. Paul Krugman, similarly, in his uh, textbook for macroeconomics for undergraduates, explains this. He says, other factors equal, of course, resources matter, no? They make production more productive. So if you have water, you can produce more from a farm than if you didn't have water. That's obvious. And he says, probably, at the beginning, in the 19th century, etc., resources did matter. But he says, changes in technology, institutions, human or physical capital, have diminished the relative importance of resources. And he says, and this is the main argument of economists, only factors that have increasing returns, like technology or institutions, can explain sustained growth. Natural resources have a limit, so of course I cannot explain how growth keeps going and going and going. I share the distaste of uh, economists for with geographical determinism, and I think it's obvious that climate, for example, is not destiny, you know? It's not that if you're born in the sun or in the rain, it depends, you know, you're going to be rich. That's obviously not the case. And of course, if you do economic regressions like economists do, you will not find an effect of water availability on growth. Why you won't find it? Because you can import water or you can import products that have water. You can transfer water as California transfers water from elsewhere or as Israel transfers water from elsewhere. Or you can bring foods grown with water. So in effect, you don't see water featuring as something that can drive growth. And it is assumed that there are categories like capital, like how much capital or infrastructures or big infrastructures you have to transfer water, or trade. But this tells us very little about the role of water in the economy. In a, in a sense, it assumes a way what has to be explained, which is how water plays out in the process of growth. I think for the way economists treat growth, David Will's textbook on growth is pretty illustrative. So he has a last chapter on resources. Always there is a last chapter on resources, you know? It's like, by the way, yes, we know there is also the question of environment and resources. So let us say a few things here. So, no, it's not to incorporate resources into a theory of growth. So all the serious stuff have been said at the beginning, you know, which are the drivers of growth. At the end, there is also the chapter on resources, but not to say why, how resources might affect growth, but it is to show how, despite their obvious importance, under certain conditions, they do not matter. And then to prove that these conditions are the ones that we are actually observing. This type or line of reasoning was first rehearsed by Robert Solo, a, fam a famous economist, when he replied to the limits of growth report by the Club, Club of Rome. Basically what Solo said that was that if resources are in shortage, 
as long as they are properly priced, they will get expensive. And if they get expensive, either we will use them more efficiently, or we will find some ways to substitute them, either by different materials or by changing our patterns of consumption. This is a pretty standard uh, argument economists will make about resources. So having shown that the data that resources prices are not increasing, growth continues, then the conclusion is so resources are not something to worry about and we can safely assume them away from any theory of growth. So for Californians though, I would argue, it is little consolation to know that if they could price their water perfectly, they would then use it or deplete it for that matter efficiently. Or that they could grow or degrow, if that was the case, along an optimal path, efficient path. That's what economists are concerned with. Or it is little consolation to know that if there are substitutes, like desalination, they will emerge when the prices increase. Sure, we can say that at the limit, and if the prices get very high, we can substitute loam for brown grass. Or we can substitute drinking water for thirst. Let me be a little bit populist here. So you can substitute everything, of course, but this doesn't tell you along which path are you going and what are you substituting for. So there, again, this broad big picture of economics, of economics tells us very little about the role of water in the growth process. So, a more have a bottle fitting the occasion, I think. So, <laughs> California needs water. <laughs> uh, environmental and regional economists have dealt a little bit more seriously with the question of resources than macroeconomists. So, econometric studies in the American West in the 1970s, for the 1960s, found that water projects and investments had no impact on regional growth or on the location of industries, so no importance for water. This seemed to confirm the general macro picture that water is not that important for the economy. The problem, however, with econometrics is, and Michael Hahnemann, this is not me, it's Michael Hahnemann, a famous uh, notable water economist, makes this point, which I found it resonated with uh, my thinking. The problem with econometrics for those of you who might know it, is the, the causality model. So they're looking for a single cause that is sufficient to cause something else. So the question is, is water sufficient causation for growth? Can we explain the output of different countries on the basis of how much water or how much they invest into water? Hahnemann makes the point that there is sufficient causation and there is necessary causation. So water might not be a sufficient cause for growth. So you can, if you pump more water, you will not pump the economy more. But if you don't have water, you cannot have growth. It's a different argument. And this cannot be captured by the econometrics or by the statistics of, uh, with which economists try to establish this relation. The second problem with econometrics is that is you are trying to find some kind of universal relationships. So you're saying everywhere and always, does water cause growth or not? It might be that water caused growth in a particular type of economy in the 1930s in California, but it doesn't cause in the 1970s. And that is mine, and you cannot just find them in generalized uh, looks at the cross section of data. Edward Barbier, who is a resource economist, sketches an interesting model of resource based growth, which he says applies and is up for the early stages of development, especially of economies that develop on the frontier, like California was a frontier economy. Abundant resources, in this case, relative to labor propel capital accumulation. And then there is a very nice and interesting paper, which is not at all a statistical or quantitative paper, by Marxist geographer, actually, Richard Walker, who shows how California indeed grew, exploiting a sequence of frontiers. First oil, gold, then oil, and then agriculture. Water was particularly crucial in the face of agriculture. So without water, the nice climate of California wouldn't produce anything because most of, the, most of the state is, uh, is uh, arid. So water was brought with a lot of investments uh, from the mountains of the, of the north, from the snowpack of the north and the rivers of the north to the south of the state to water, and also from the rivers in the east. Uh, but how was, water, how was this water moved? It was moved by mobilizing the surpluses that they were created by the gold bonanza and the oil bonanza before. So here we see a much more complicated process of development and growth. 
through its surpluses, and this fits a little bit for those of you who fit, followed my first lecture last time, surpluses are reinvested, they produce resources, that they produce new surpluses. Water there plays a key role. Without it, you couldn't have agricultural growth in California. You couldn't have general growth in California. You couldn't settle Los Angeles, for example, without water. So, of course, water is not important for cinema. You know, the more water you pump, it's not the better movies you would take out of Hollywood, no? But without water, you wouldn't have this city and this industry uh, never in the first place there. So this gives us a little bit a more complicated picture of, of the role of water in the economic process. In an economy like California, which transforms towards services, though, it is a reasonable claim to make that the importance of agriculture, and hence water, because water is most important for agriculture, diminishes. And so does the contribution of water to productivity. And this might explain, for example, why in the 70s, if someone did statistics in the 70s, you wouldn't find any obvious relationship between investment in water and growth. Because agriculture had stopped being that important uh, in this point. <coughs> uh, another interesting model, economic model, by Edward Barbier, models economic growth with water infrastructure as an input and water scarcity as a constraint. And then he finds that investment on water infrastructure can increase growth, especially in places that there is scarcity, but only up to a point, beyond which the costs of new infrastructure reduce economic output. So if you spend too much money on building dams at some point, at, at the beginning this helps you. Over and beyond a certain point, it starts start becoming a drug of your economy. So you have positive effects initially, negative effects afterwards. But of course, it's impossible if you're in California right now to know if you're here or if you're there, and whether it makes sense to invest more on water or not. California's dams today lay half empty because of the drought. One of the questions is whether this is because of climate change, or whether, and this is equally worrying, whether this is a regular, decades-long climatic cycle. An interesting thing is that when uh, the West was uh, settled and the first big uh, water projects were designed, this was in, a, in this period here, in the beginning of the 20th century, which was, at hindsight, it was a particularly wet period. But the people who were building them, the dams, didn't know that because all the data they had was from river and the rainfall records from the last 20, 30 years. So they thought, okay, that's the normal, that's how we build the systems, that's how much water we have. But now we have tree records, and tree records, it's a new technique, so from the trees you can, uh, you can understand how much uh, precipitation uh, there was there many hundred years ago. So when you reconstruct the climate like this, you suddenly see that this was an exceptionally wet period, and the, the canon is these huge periods of drought. So California might be entering one of these huge periods of drought, uh, be it due climate change or just be it normal climate. I mean, climate change will even make things worse if that's the case. As another problem is that as farmers are restricted from getting access to the surface water, to the rivers, because there's very little to allocate, farmers are tending to ground water, and that's how they have tried to deal with the issue the last three or four years. But what happens is that when you start exploding from groundwater, the aquifer falls. Now there are discussions even if this might increase the risks of uh, earthquake in the state. So this is another side effect of, of the water shortage. And of course there are the environmental impacts. And these are the, these are the populations of salmon in the rivers uh, of, uh, of California. The salmon's, uh, the salmon's swimming uh, towards the sea. So you can see that they are at the, at the historical uh, low, and it's almost nearing the level of extinction. So there are a lot of impacts other than the impacts of the economy. The question still remains, the question I still started with, does water scarcity limit economic growth? And I would say it depends, and I mean, we cannot, we cannot really say. We do not know if we are in a 1920 situation or in a 1970 situation, and how important water is for the economy. But with some data, we can see that water is less important for the economy than it used to be. This is the importance of agriculture for California economy, which is just 2%. And this is how much water different sectors use in California. And agriculture uses 80% of water. So just by looking at that, what could you say? 
And say like, okay, water, okay, you say agriculture people bad, no? But that's not uh, the point, because they are not bad, they are also producing food, uh, it's exported, etc. But what you can say is like, okay, if, it, if you're just talking about 2% of the economy, so even if they decline a little bit their production, or even if they suffer from the drought, this is not, this is, if, if they lose a little bit of water, or if they suffer from the drought, this is not going to affect the economy of the state that much, it's just 2%, right? Some people say that this is bigger if you look into the multiplier effects of agriculture, so it's probably at 5 or 6 percent. But still, it's a small part of the overall economy. So there are arguments that they say that just with 12, 12 point, 13 percent less water for agriculture, you could uh, increase 50 percent the supply of water for the cities or for the ecosystems. There have been already uh, significant savings in water use, both in farms and in cities. And water use, as you see here, is the blue line, has plateaued and even declined a little bit to 97 level. And still the economy keeps growing. Note, how, however, that while California's uh, output has doubled, so here I have, uh, sorry, is this picture clear? So if you see this picture, you would say things are going pretty fine, California is becoming more efficient in the way it's using water. Now population is increasing. GDP is increasing, water withdrawals are more or less the same, no? they are steady. This is considered like a case of dematerialization, as it's called, or dewaterization, it's an awful term I found in a paper. You know? <laughs> so I don't want to use it, but let's call it dematerialization for the time being. So you could ask, is it, first of all, is it reasonable that this is happening? One, one first question one might pose is to what extent, let's say, this stagnation here, is a result of economic stagnation. So for example, if you take just this, you say, oh, GDP is growing great, no? But if you take the median income in California, it's more or less stagnant. I couldn't plot it here, <coughs> I'm not very good at plotting up Excel, but imagine a more or less income that stagnates after here. So it could be part, part of this supposed conservation, partly it's because of stagnation of incomes. So only the very rich people are getting the majority of the pie, and the very rich people, okay, they can water their lawn up to a point, they can drink water as much as they can, but at some point it's over, no money goes somewhere else. Uh, another question that we might ask if we see this graph is whether this thing here, the stagnation of water withdrawals, is because there is a peak in consumption, like there is a lot of conservation, and California is really using well its water resources, or whether there is a peak in production, so it's that they cannot withdraw more water. I think I have this graph here, yes. And this graph suggests a story like this, because it shows this is the cumulative capacity, how much water is stored in dams in California. And it shows that this has been increasing, but it has reached a peak. And this peak is more or less at the level of the available water uh, that of the water that is available. <coughs> so it seems that there is not much more capacity to increase also the water production. So is it a peak in water consumption because of conservation or is it a peak in water production because of no more places to dump? You've dumped everything. Now another interesting fact here. Okay, yes. Another interesting fact and I think this is the most uh, important part of my story that I would uh, like you to keep, is that if you look at the internal water, if you look at the consumption of products in California, okay, and you look at how much water they use, uh, this confirms the picture we just discussed, more or less stable and declining. But if you start taking into account all the products that they are consumed in California, including those that they are imported from, uh, from abroad, and how much water is embedded in them, I don't mean physically embedded, but how much water was used to produce them, okay? So I don't mean a tomato, how much water you can squeeze out of it, but I mean how much water went to produce this tomato, okay? The, this is called virtual water. So if you look at that, you suddenly see a very different picture, and water use has continued increasing in California. It hasn't declined. And this actually is from a very recent PhD thesis of Berkeley, of a very good friend of mine, uh, Julian Fulton, who was the first one to try to do these type of calculations. 
So if you <coughs> if you start counting this so-called water footprint of California, rather than the actual water use within California, you see a pattern that this more or less a little bit slower than growth, but increase more or less at the pace of growth. So what I find amazing here, and I'm going to go back in the discussions into this question, is how in an economy that it's supposed to be, uh, you know, it's the Airbnb and digital and Google and this uh, ethereal, uh, weightless, immaterial economy, the actual use of water, if you, con if you con consider everything that is consumed in this state, keeps going up. So we don't see any dematerialization in effect uh, in California. We see, instead of producing and using this water from sources of California, bringing it from sources from other parts of the world. Okay? So this was the ecological economics part. Now, uh, shake your head and get ready for the political ecology part. <laughs> this is a little bit more fun, I think. Not too many graphs. I don't know who, who of you like graphs or words. <laughs> there were a lot of graphs in the first place. So now come the words. And now come, uh, I think it's a little bit of a idiosyncratic review, I would say here. Because it's works that have influenced me, I like them a lot, and they have shaped the way I think, uh, works about water. So it's a little bit of a review, but I think there is an overall argument coming. And from ag aggregate effects, because before I was talking aggregately, now economic growth as a whole in the state, to the uneven distribution of the costs and benefits of water and development, and the role of political power in saving place, who gets what. Only in this way we may explain why agriculture, for example, commands such control over water in California. If we talk in general about water and growth, now you cannot understand this inner power place that, is, that determine who gets what in terms of water, or why conservation faces obstacles, which is something that has interested me a lot. Let me make two st starting and rather trivial points, but they are out of there in the literature, and I think they are obvious. So the first one is that California's water rights system is very particular. So uh, it's a first come, first take the right to use water system. And the first ones who came were farmers. So most of the water rights in the system, the, the people who have the right to use water, are the people who first started using water for irrigation many years ago, and then they passed it from generation to generation. So a lot of the water rights are in the hands of farmers. And although there have been established markets to let them sell these rights to cities that might need the, the water, most of these transfers have been temporal. So during a drought, farmers might sell water to a city that needs water. But farmers are very hesitant to pass these rights uh, uh, permanently to someone else because they know that then they lose this water and they lose a, pot a particular a potential source of, of their livelihood or of their income because we're talking also about big farms there. So this creates a very particular power dynamic that the right to use water, the law, is in the hands of agriculture. So even if they're just 1% of the economy, they have the power of the law on their side. The second point is that California politics are all, as all US politics, as we know from movies and from the newspapers, are susceptible to influence from lobbies, especially through electoral campaign and donations. And for farmers, water is a very vital source of revenue. So they are more likely to organize collectively and put resources and money, to say so, to influence the political process. I don't think this is a surprise uh, for anyone. Of course, over the years, the same has been done by others. So urban water agencies also have put money and they have muscle, muscle to influence the regulatory process and get more water for them. And more recently, environmentalists with a lot of resources also themselves. And this has given a rise to a particular type of pork and barrel politics. Someone who is from the US has to tell me how this term pork and barrel came about. I, I checked on the internet, but I couldn't really find. So I just put the pork in a barrel there. Pork and barrel, though, what it means, that you give a little bit to everyone, you know, rather than really finding the best policy or, this, or changing the political economy of something. So, environmentalists get something, farmers get something, cities get something. In the last bond, for example, for California, 2.7 billion went to build uh, new dams and new big infrastructures. 1.5 went to restore some ecosystems, water set protection. So, everyone is more or less happy. 
It's not that the problems are resolved, but everyone gets a little bit of money and more or less things uh, continue. Now I'm getting to the more interesting stuff. Um, so there is a, a big claim in the literature that especially came out in the 1980s was to rethink a little bit the relationship between water and power. So uh, an interesting say that captures this is that water doesn't flow downhill. Normally water flows downhill, no? from the mountains goes down naturally. But it says it flows uphill to political power. So if you have the, the power, you can get the water to flow in your direction. And this has been used a lot, and a lot of interesting stories have been into precisely about the power of cities and the uh, interests in California to get the water that they needed in order to have growth and development. So there is a very interesting literature in the 1980s looking at how urban growth coalitions of businessmen, politicians, and planners secured water for urban development. And uh, the emblematic story here is the Owens Valley water grab, which is the one that is memorialized in the, in the film Chinatown. So the film is about this story. And this is the story of how the small town of Los Angeles, yes, it was a small town at some point, accumulated secretly water rights from the farmers of uh, the Owens Valley. And then channeled this water without a proper permission, channeled this water to the city, drank the lake, Owens Lake, from where the farmers were dependent. But also, and here is the interesting twist that gives the twist also to the movie Chinatown, as uh, Los Angeles was getting this water from the farmers and bringing it to start developing the city, etc., uh, it annexed a, a valley that was called, it's called San Fernando, which was just an agricultural <laughs> valley there, and some clever guys with connections to the water company bought land there on the knowledge that water would come to the city, and then when water came to the city, they took a lot of water for San Fernando and they started selling land there for housing. And they became uh, millionaires in a day. So that's a very famous story that has been used for many as a model of understanding these relationships between power, urbanization, uh, growth and water, you know, the control of water. Examining power and water in the 1970s, San Jose, and this is a paper I like a lot, although it's not that famous. Uh, Walker and Williams proposed that rather than asking whether water contributes to regional growth, which was the kind of question I was asking before now, so this is a little bit annulling myself and saying that what I was saying before was not necessarily the important question. So rather than asking whether what water contributes to growth, we should ask how elites mobilize water to make sure that there are no obstacles to growth. So they change a little bit the perspectives and they see, look at the political and social process through which water is made to flow uphill. And they have a comment about water supply and water conservation. They say, unlike water supply, water conservation is not part of the matrix of regional growth, and this is why it's not taken up. In, I think, the best book about uh, water and power, I don't know if Peter, you've written a book and I'm offending you now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, not a, that's, that's a very good... Uh, I mean, that's, that's one book that I consider is something you can take from this lecture is if you haven't read this book, uh, go ahead and read it. So I'm going to talk a lot about it till the end of the presentation. But in, uh, in this classic Rivers of Empire, the causation between power and water for Donald Worcester, Worcester runs both ways. Centralized control of water is part and parcel of centralized control over people. Hierarchy is the inevitable outcome of large dams and canals which require the massing of a pool of labor and large institutions with capital and expertise. Worcester claimed in this book that California was a capitalist hydraulic empire. Much alike, Carl Witt Fogels, from whom he took his theory, ancient agrarian hydraulic empire, empires of the East. Witt Fogels' thesis was that the large-scale systems of irrigation upon which Asian empire depended required the centralized bureaucracy and the despotic rule to organize labor and surplus appropriation. So big infrastructures go together with big uh, bureaucracies and a very centralized control of power. That was the thesis that Worcester took and he applied it to California. And he, he made people see California not as this frontier economy of uh, little small farmers. I mean, it was that thing, but he was explaining how it became a sort of capitalist empire through these huge water projects. Here, I have something from you, Peter, about the 
I've read. And I find very interesting is how this type of hydrocracies, hydro hydraulic bureaucracies, and how, with a mission to develop water, to have huge projects, are not just a phenomenon of California or the West or the Eastern empires, but something that we see over and over in different places. In a sense, it was also what I was studying in Athens. I have called it, following others, as the hydraulic paradigm, a constellation of social and physical technologies, institutions, and values and norms predicated on the constant expansion of water supply. What is interesting here is a claim that Donald Worcester makes, and he says that this hydrocracies or hydraulic uh, bureaucracies develop a sort of instrumental rationality. Sorry if I'm bombarding you with too many concepts now. So what is instrumental rationality? It's a term he got from the Frankfurt School of the, of the time. It's, 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 it's a very interesting uh, argument. It basically says that uh, means, in this case water infrastructure, do not serve ends. They are not instruments to ends but they are pursued as ends in and of themselves. So dams, in a sense, are not the means to produce something, water supply or growth. They are the end themselves, building dams, expanding the mission, the hydraulic mission. Worcester's analysis paved the way for a very other interesting analysis, which is by Eric Wingerdam, who puts water squarely into the dynamics of capital accumulation. So Wingerdam takes the idea of a particular mode of production based on uh, where water is central, and he puts it into understanding capitalism through the lens of water. Zwingeda, for example, showed how surpluses from the export of agricultural commodities financed a series of dams that water mostly in lit and glaze in the city of Guayaquil in Ecuador. Dams from the reading of Zwingeda are not just means for growth, but they are also uh, uh, projects that they absorb and fix capital, solving uh, the periodic crisis of capital accumulation. So you can understand the logic of why you have more and more pressure to build dams, not just because of their instrumentality or what they're going to offer, but from the fact that capital needs them in order to circulate and solve problems of overproduction. In, Zwing in Spain, Zwingerdot changes a little bit this perspective, and why he still focuses on the role of big hydraulic infrastructure as a process of capital accumulation, he also sees how this is integral also to processes of nation building. He shows how Franco reimagined and reconfigured through water the physical and political geography of the country. And Spain, for those of you who might uh, know, has more dams per capita than any other country in the world. There are also more recent books that make similar claims. And this is a book that I had just by accident. I, walk, I walked into a presentation here on the fourth floor next to my room, and I saw a, a guy presenting this book. It was fantastic, actually, because he's talking about contemporary Sudan. And it's a very similar story, how Sudan is developing huge dams in the night as a process and project of authoritative modernization, very similar to what Franco did, very similar. But dams here, interestingly, may not even work. I mean, what, what I found very interesting here in this uh, presentation about Sudan was like, at the end, they, don't, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't produce uh, enough water for agriculture, and they didn't even help to electrify the country. So this forces us to think a little bit about the symbolic uh, role of uh, dams. They're symbolic as uh, signals of uh, modernization, as signals of power over nature. As, as signals of uh, nation building. And there is a lot, for example, a very interesting work along these lines is by Maria Kaika, a friend and colleague, who also studied Athens. And she showed the symbolic power of dam building. She, showed, she studied the architecture of dams. And she showed how it's done every 30 or 40 years in Athens. Its architecture was symbolizing the idea of the elites about how they imagined what Greece was, where was it coming from. At the beginning, they had all these ancient ornaments, you know, we are the continuation of ancient Greeks. This thing changed. By the 1960s, there were huge engineering feats, built like military style, it was a military dictatorship, we are powerful, we are strong. So dams have a very important also symbolic role that they play, over and above their economic uh, rationality. However, as Sudanese elites found at, its peril, at their peril, 
spending on white elephants. This is another metaphor I got, uh, I got in the US. So white elephants is if you spend in, uh, a lot of money on useless projects. Can get you as far, especially if the rest of the economy cannot subsidize this symbolic capital. So in the 1970s, there was the, the oil crisis, the neoliberal squeeze of budget that, think, that followed, civil and environmental sensibilities, and the transformation of economies beyond agriculture and urbanization. So in some sense, water projects have become less and less attractive, economically attractive. I mean, they, they were always in a sense, but they have become much more. Spain's national hydrological plan was meant to conclude the Francoist vision of big transfers from the Ebro in the north to farms and resorts in the arid south and east. But it was defeated politically after a huge mobilization. So there was a lot of resistance also to this. Also economically it didn't make sense. The European Union was not going to finance it. So in a sense it gets harder and harder to keep accumulating and promoting this type of projects. Zwingedau, closing his book about the water in Spain, he notes a new type of techno-fix, he calls it, a new type of fix of capital accumulation, this time around desalination. So he says the new move is desalination. Water pricing and water markets. And this is similar in different parts of the world. Karen Bakker called this the market environmentalism. So a new paradigm, not hydraulic paradigm anymore, but a market paradigm. Alongside this, we might think also of a competing paradigm, or antagonistic, or coexisting paradigm, that I would, I would call the eco-modernist paradigm, which is the paradigm not to shift these things to the, to the market in the private sector, but the state to step in and start again building new technologies, desalination plants, smarter dams, promote intensified agriculture with GMOs, uh, do this in the name of protecting both the environment and keeping growth going. It's also called green growth. Okay? So there are these competing paradigms. So you would wonder, where is the other paradigm coming? And the other paradigm is the one I want to talk a little bit about, which is about uh, what I call the growth paradigm, but this is not, this is not established uh, in the water literature. But let's think of a different fourth alternative to these paradigms I've talked about now. So again, we can take the clue from uh, Worcester's book for this fourth paradigm. So in, the, in his book, uh, Worcester reclaims the memory of the utopian communities of California, the proto-movement for appropriate technology in late 19th century, <coughs> and of pioneer farmers who escaped to the West to live a simple and free life. OK, this sounds very romantic, but maybe it was now. We never know. And he reclaims, and uh, Worcester develops a big part of the book of that, a, project, a plan that there was by a very famous and notable engineer of the time, John Wesley Powell. Ironically, his name was given to a huge dam uh, in the north of the country, I learned later. He was a famous engineer, and he had a plan for hundreds of watershed defined communities owned in common and managed for the public good. So this was an alternative plan that was there around the time of the big water projects of California were conceived and built. This, I didn't know how to call it, so I gave three names. Kibbutz, like, because it reminds a little bit of Kibbutz, this vision that Boster is promoting there. Now, small self-sufficient communities using localized uh, sources of water. Or we might call it sufficiency uh, alternative, or we might call it the growth alternative. Appears in different forms, in different eras. Worcester argues that in California, it was crushed in the process of empire building. So his main claim in the book is how well the farmers wanted something like this. So we might argue whether this is true or not. Huh? But he argues why farmers wanted something like this. Uh, what, the, what the state pushed forward was these huge infrastructures. It's interesting to see that in, uh, when the law to build the huge infrastructures that the water in California was promoted, it was done on the condition that it will only provide water to small-scale farmers, because small-scale farmers were very powerful in California at the time. So the law had the provision that said only up to 160 hectares, small for American standards, up to 160 hectares of farms can get water from the, from the central canal project. But of course, what there are is when this happened, and when you had this huge bureaucracy, this huge system, all these engineers coming there, of course, the next step was inevitable. And this provision was forgotten, and huge farms emerged that took advantage of the ample quantities of water. So he argues basically 
that the dream of an alternative of an alternative model for California was crossed also through the infrastructure. Technologies and infrastructures, hence I would argue, are sites of conflict where the direction of a society is saved. Writer, also studying at Dunn in California, saw something very similar. He saw the history of Hetsi, Hetz, which was uh, also another emblematic project of water in California in the 1920s. And again, he shows that it was not just a problem of the techniques or whether the costs and benefits of this dumb work, but it was a class, this is not the right term, especially these days, a class of civilizations, I would like to say, but it was a class of different ways of seeing nature and our relation to it. And it was, he marks there the birth of environmentalism. The idea that nature should not necessarily uh, of, of this movement is how to, how to get dams that they are not that useful and they don't provide that much water anymore in their alternative, to take them out of use. So both Worcester and Richter, in a way, say, look, dams and these technologies have always been a center of locus of conflict of how we save our society, how we save our relationship to nature. OK, I think I'm overtaking my time, so I would have to, to skip to the conclusion. So sorry for that. So let me conclude by asking where, what this might mean for the growth. So what do I mean by the growth? So how many of you know what do I mean by the growth? Let me see if I have to explain it. Oh, very few. So I'm talking to water nerds today now. So I have to, <laughs> I have to think, okay. So by the growth, I mean, we have defined it as the equitable downscaling of a society's throughput or footprint. So this means, using less resources in total, using less less footprint, not just using less resources domestically, but overall. No? Less water, less materials, less soil, less carbon. So my first claim today on the basis of the presentation is that unlike what some people in the green growth literature argue, uh, one of the first uh, claims I have to make today is that the link between growth and resource use has not been broken. I show you why it has not been broken in California, but I think if we see also the global picture, it is obvious that this link has not been broken. So this is global water use in agriculture, global use in industry, global use in cities of water. This is number of dams proposed and uh, under construction. Sorry, under construction, yes, we proposed. So we see that this escalating trajectory, the, the constant arrow trajectory of growth, is still there. So I think what is happening is that we have also a structural transformation, that places like California, rather than producing all this in their own territories, are importing it from abroad. But the overall dynamic has not been broken. So if I want to be metaphorical, I would say that the rivers of empire have been globalized and have become virtual. Virtual, not in the sense that they don't exist, but that they are imported in products. Water is in pro virtual water is imported into products. Conflicts in that sense, you might not have that many conflicts over water in California, but they have been exported in the places where water is now produced, in where the new dams are taking place, in India or China, or in other parts of the world, and where agricultural intensification is taking place to supply products to places like California. So one claim that I want to discard here is the claim that very often is uh, made. It's an eco-modernist claim that uh, our economies are getting dematerialized. We're using, using less resources because we are growing, and everyone should follow the same path. So the, the argument there is that every, if everyone was to follow the same path, who would we import then the water and the products from? You know, if everyone was just doing Google uh, companies, you know? Summer, they would have to be dams and uh, water, and water producing for food. So you might argue, though, that we don't need to eat more and more food, or we don't need to, to produce more and more water for food. So then I put the interesting question is, sure, if you look at the economy of California, you might say it's not such an impossible thing that just 1% is agriculture. Some food products are improved. Probably the level of food sufficiency, the average level of food sufficiency, you know, there, there are, of course, this, uh, uh, redistributive issues, but the overall level of eating 
is fine. Couldn't this be reduced without affecting the economy? No? Why would we need the growth? I would say sure, in theory, and if you see the paper, you would say yes, it could be done. But I would change the question and say why it hasn't happened. How is it that a state like California, that it's the exemplar state of the weightless economy, of the digital economy, etc., keeps using more and more resources, more and more food, more and more, more water. So rather than just asserting that, yes, maybe it could happen in the future that this doesn't happen, I want to ask why it keeps happening. And I, 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 I suspect that we haven't managed to conceptualize still perfectly the relationship between resources and the economy, resources and growth. I think still we are caught in older models, but they are either at the level of the nation or at the level of econometrics and big pictures, but they don't really capture how an economy uses uh, resources. Or of course there is the second possibility, which is um, completely wrong, and in a few years they start decoupling and the resource use declines in California and food consumption declines and water use, uh, water use declines. But I have a feeling that uh, that's not the case. And I think there is more research to be done there to try to establish this link. So my claim from a degrowth perspective is that probably if, if uh, the material footprint of California was to decrease, if the carbon footprint of California was to decrease, if the water footprint of California was to decrease, more than likely this would mean also some sort of degrowth of the economy, decline of the economy. A contraction of the economy. So this is a very different argument than a probably stupid argument that you could think I could make, which would be, okay, let's reduce the GDP of California. Of course, no one's going to do that. Let's reduce the GDP of California so that water use declines. Of course, this is not the case. I mean, if you reduce the GDP of California, water use doesn't decline because water use belongs to a sector that accounts for 1% of the economy. So that's not... That's not the degrowth argument. The degrowth argument is that if you are to reduce water use, water footprint, material footprint, cumber footprint, more than likely this would mean that the economy also would have to be restructured in some way and contract. But contract not in the sense of the same economy contract, but something different happening. And I think in this question of something different happening, I find very insightful uh, the words of uh, Donald Worcester. So before closing, two minutes if you want to read this final piece from his book, which is how he closes also his book, and that I find quite, I have found quite inspiring words in my mind as a revolution. Represents an alternative to the culture of more is better. And it's very, very, very close, and that's why I put this slide here. It's very close to the literature on the growth, or the work, for example, of Serge Latouche, who writes about the growth, and he calls it the imaginary of frugal abundance. I think it's very clear you see the same word being used there, no? frugality, simplicity, as a, as, a, as a way of abundance. But looking at that after some time, I mean, I read it that when I was, uh, first time when I was 28, now 43, so it's 15 years difference, so people change. And I think my reading also of this part changed. And uh, I read a, a review of the book by Tim Strossing. I don't know who Tim is, but he wrote a very good review of Worcester's book. And he argues that after 350 pages on monumental institutional, political, and technological forces, this sudden turn of Worcester on a thorough type individualism is not only anticlimactic, but also can become politically impotent. So if you just focus on this thing alone, it's impotent. It doesn't go anywhere. Because of course the reaction to this type of desire can be very easily tourist packages. Capitalism can very often easily offer tourist packages, commodified packages to the desert. Right? So that you go and you contemplate there and you do your yoga and then you go back to, to your home. Right? It's, uh, what's the name of the festival to the desert? Yeah. Yeah. The burning man. Yeah. yeah, so there's the burning man. So you can get your burning man and be happy. So Strossing very rightly says that the challenge is precisely, I mean, he likes what Worcester is saying, but he says the challenge is not to stop here, but in defining what is the content of these true needs Worcester is talking about, and what they actually might look like in a social organization in the new American West. 
and then think how we can create the conditions and the movements, political and social, that would mobilize and educate their members to implement genuine alternative social ideas based on these true needs. And I think this is what captures the spirit of the growth. So it's an idea of how do you structure an alternative, that it's not a standard alternative of either better growth or better development or inclusive development or inclusive growth that follows the same lines and is trying to be corrected. How do you frame something different that captures the spirit but gives it a different form of social and political organization? And this obviously, this type of spirit, this type of organization would come also with less water use or with less material use or with less resource use. So this more or less captures a little bit the spirit. How likely is this happening? What's Strauss is saying? So older, worser, and wiser, or more pessimistic, I would say, he's not very optimistic about the possibility of what he was claiming when he was younger. So in a recent paper, he says, we must realize that the history of any empire is a history of resistance to sweeping change. History of the California empire, no? A history of profound inertia. And the dreams of truly radical change are often only dreams and not realities. So Worcester computes, okay, yes, I was hopeful, but in 1987, now it's 2015, you know, things do not seem to change as, as I thought. So he, he concludes, and this is like a conclusion that many people read, he says empires collapse, they do not change on their own. So he says the ancient empires collapse, the Roman empire collapsed, our empire will collapse at some point, but it's not that we're going to change it for the better. But I don't want to leave it here, so somehow I would say that we cannot afford yet to follow his pessimism, not at least we get as old as he is. You know? I think some of you have even more years until you reach uh, Worcester's age. And I think no, it's not just a matter of age, I think it's also a matter of pessimism. So it's a matter also of constantly having a certain sort of optimism. And this optimism providing resources, intellectual resources, to think about alternatives. I think if we reach this dead end of thinking there are no alternatives and stop to thinking about them, it becomes a self-fulfilled uh, prophecy. So I'll leave it there. Uh, if you want to read my talk, which was actually a little bit different uh, than what I said, because I tried to go a little bit of the uh, script, but I will have my talk available tomorrow on my Twitter account with a, with a slide, so you can download and read the whole thing if it was uh, too fast. Thank you.